I'd like to pick up um, with uh, the, some last works by Boucher uh, that I, <coughs> excuse me, uh, that I was talking about uh, last time. These all relate to uh, Boucher's uh, work for Madame de Pompadour. Now we saw her as the maîtresse en titre, the title mistress, um, who emerged at court in uh, late 1746, early 1747, and became the royal mistress. Remember, um, her uh, real name was uh, Jean-Antoinette Poisson, Jeannie Fish, and she was bourgeoise, from a uh, middle class, but from a very wealthy family. From an early age, she had been groomed uh, for exactly this role by her uncle, um, who may well have been her father, um, anyway, she had all the charms, all the social attainments and graces and the education that would have been required of a young woman who would have attracted Louis XV's interest. The fact that her family, her mother, her uncle, and, and everybody was really behind this uh, was important because it shows how established the idea of a royal mistress is and what, um, uh, and what kind of goodies that could accrue to the mistress and to her nearest and dearest um, as part of a, an economic exchange. We may now view this as a form of prostitution, and I suppose it rather was, but it certainly in Pompadour's case was tremendously effective. Despite uh, 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 all of her training and preparation for this role, it was also essential that they find the right kind of husband for her, because a royal mistress has to be married. In case of a pregnancy, um, uh, then the, the, the father the, uh, uh, could be claimed to be the actual husband uh, rather than the king, although the child you know, undoubtedly uh, would have been you know, a royal bastard, um, but th this created a sense of social cover. They found exactly this kind of person. Um, he was created Marquis de Pompadour, so his wife became the Marquise or Madame de Pompadour and he got uh, lucrative government uh, jobs and things like that, ambassadorial appointments. So he was conveniently out of the way and she was conveniently married and he could have been brought back, you know, um, if, if the situation um, arose. Boucher was an artist, as I mentioned, in the high Rococo, very closely associated with the court of Louis XV in the 1740s and in the 1750s. He was particularly attached to Pompadour and helped her to craft her visual image through portraiture after uh, the end of her physical relationship with the queen, uh, with the king. The fact that Pompadour managed to maintain her very eminent and influential position at court after the end of her physical relationship with Louis XV was unprecedented among royal mistresses. This had never happened before. Uh, this created tremendous uh, sort of scorn for her among traditional aristocrats because A, they didn't think her birth was sufficiently uh, high uh, to uh, entitle her to this kind of role or to this kind of influence. And in the past, royal mistresses, when the king tired of them, had simply been pensioned off and sent to live somewhere else, just sort of out of the side of the court. Madame de Pompadour remained until she died in 1764, and she was the king's most intimate advisor, not only on amorous issues, she certainly was that too, but on other kinds of political issues as well. Louis XV absolutely hated the art of governing, so the more people he could foist off a lot of the decisions onto, he was perfectly willing to do that. And he trusted Pompadour's intelligence, and he understood that she was going to promote her own favorites and her own creatures and family and all that kind of stuff, but that was just simply to be expected. In, in some, he trusted her judgment and turned over, at least unofficially, a lot of state business uh, to her. This portrait that you see here, uh, it, this is in Munich in the Alta Pinacothek, dates from 50, 1756. This is at least four years after the end of the physical relationship with the king. Remember in Nautier's portrait of her as Diana, she saw shown as this young, sort of nubile young woman in an exterior setting, uh, beautifully made up, uh, alluring, full bosomed, the whole nine yards, exactly the sort of object of sexual desire that one would expect for a woman who had just become uh, Louis XV's mistress. That role had to be defined, redefined visually after 1756. And again, she and Boucher are both on sort of unchart, in, in uncharted territory because there had never been a royal mistress who needed this kind of re, remake or makeover, that's the word, makeover of her reputation and her um, appearance. 
From 1752 until her death in 1764, her iconography, her image, uh, was focused on the notion of the royal friend rather than the royal mistress. Uh, Louis XV did not go without bedmates. I mean, he, you know, this sort of serial um, uh, monogamy uh, that was characteristic uh, of, of that particular monarch. But her cultural influence and her association and friendship with him remained. The portrait that uh, Boucher painted of her in 1756 shows us one of these enlightened uh, type of women um, who were not, I would say, common during the Rococo period. They were even then called exceptional women. But the fact that women could even rise to these sort of levels of influence, both in terms of culture and art, but also in terms of politics um, and of other pursuits, um, is uh, remarkable. She's showing herself here uh, as part of a phenomenon that's called la femme savante, that is the learned woman. We're still back on the key terms list from October 16th. Uh, this is the third item from the bottom, third item from the bottom, la femme savante, uh, the learned woman. She shows herself here surrounded, still elegant and pretty to be sure, uh, wearing rouge, which was limited to women of the court. Other people could, it was illegal for non-court uh, uh, people to wear uh, rouge. It was uh, basically a signifier of very elite um, aristocratic status. But she's shown here in a kind of a day dress. She's dressed informally. This seems remarkably, you know, uh, sort of formal and elegant to us, but this is a day dress. She's shown here in her study. There's an absolutely exquisite example of a Rococo writing table here with these cabriole legs, uh, the sort of gilt metal um, um, insets here. The drawer is pulled out to reveal the inkwell with the, uh, the quill pen ex extending from it. Here is the wax that would be put to the candle and then it, uh, to pour on the letter to seal it. And then the signet ring here would have been pressed down into the wax and it would have had uh, Pompadour's uh, monogram on it. Underneath this writing table, and under here you see books and papers of various sorts, you know, uh, uh, alluding to intellectual activity. This particular book, which you can't see this, but it's picked out on the spine, is a book of engravings that Pompadour did herself. Boucher taught her how to engrave. Um, in particular, she was able to engrave cameos um, and uh, uh, sort of engrave sort of linear designs on emeralds and other large uh, types of uh, gems and jewels. So she's practical in that sense. I mean, she has, she's creative. In the lower left here, um, you see another uh, scroll, the kind of thing that would have been used to help ink her engravings. Uh, the uh, peonies at her feet, look how tiny the feet are. Foot fetishism, I'm not making this up. Anyway, uh, the peonies here again are not only a flower of erotic desire, but look at how the blossoms are looking away from her. In other words, she's no longer presenting herself in that particular way. She's uh, showing herself here as a femme savant. She's in the act of reading. It looks as if someone she likes has just come into the room, and she looks up with this kind of wistful uh, look on her face. In the background, again, on top of that bookcase, you see an absolutely splendid example of a Rococo, Louis XV, Louis Cannes uh, type of clock. But inside the bookcase, uh, picked out on a couple of the spines, we see that these are volumes of the Encyclopédie. Uh, this was the great sort of scientific intellectual project um, of the Enlightenment. Um, the 18th century is interest, was very interested in taxonomies, that is, lists of things, explaining things. In other words, if you could collect every, every example of a particular phenomenon, you could somehow understand it. It's no accident that the encyclopedia, which is you know, what encyclopedia means, um, is a product of the 18th century enlightenment. This is the, the same time going on in Edinburgh, in Scotland, you have the Encyclopedia Britannica being made um, in this particular way. And other, there are examples in Germany, there are examples in Italy, and even Spain, which intellectually is in this period is a little bit backward. So she's showing herself here not only as a collector of knowledge, but it was widely known that Pompadour was a patron of the Encyclopédie project. She contributed to it. She was a subscriber. The fact that the church didn't really approve of the Encyclopédie very much uh, shows the fact that she is more willing to be a free-thinking, uh, progressive type of person than someone like the Queen. Remember in her portrait by Nautia, she shows herself reading the Bible. Uh, that's, I guarantee you, not what Pompadour is reading um, here. 
And so Pompadour, in, in reaction to the Queen's party, which are the, the devoted, pious uh, folks at court, um, she is basically showing herself as a learned woman, that is someone who's interested in contemporary thoughts and all this kind of stuff, without too much uh, 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 respect, I suppose you might say, for the strictures and the teachings of the church. Here is another example of a work commissioned from Boucher by Pompadour, and it's about a little tiny bit bigger than the sheet of paper uh, that you may uh, be taking notes on. It's a very small thing. Unfortunately, um, uh, the object itself, as it's shown in this image, does not have its original frame. When you see this in the, in the Musée de Beaux-Arts in Lyon, it actually is still in its frame, which is for some weird reason has been cut out here. But it's an elaborately carved um, uh, wooden frame gilded with gold gilt. Um, it has like rays of divine light going from it. Uh, there's a, a, a shaft of wheat and a bunch of grapes referring to the Eucharist, you know, the, uh, the grapes and the, and the bread of the Eucharist and, and Holy Communion and all of that. But as an example of Rococo religious painting, there's a remarkable sense of lightness and airiness and elegance about it. It is, yes, it's the nativity. The Christ child here is being born. That's St. Joseph over there in the background with the, uh, with the, with the ox and all that sh shepherds coming over here to the right. A midwife is in. Heaven has sort of opened up. Remember, this is on a very small scale. And it's almost like a jewel, a very precious type of object. Anyway, but the overall theme is not nearly as serious as sort of the elegance um, and, and the grace um, of the composition. This image would undoubtedly have been used by Pompadour as an object of devotion. Even Pompadour prayed and did her, you know, went to Mass and, and went to confession, though she sometimes had problems in confession um, with, with, uh, uh, with absolution and all that kind of stuff. But this would have been uh, uh, basically either placed on a wall or placed within a frame that would have been above an object that's called a prie-dieu, that is a pray-god. It's where you kneel on a little um, uh, uh, sort of velvet cushion. Uh, there's a rack up here. You can hang your rosary from one of the hooks, and you kneel on that and pray. And usually the object of devotion is an image, a small religious image of this type. So this is not a church painting at all. It's meant for a small-scale private devotion, probably in a tiny chapel or just a tiny space you would go into, kneel and pray, that would have been immediately off her bedroom. Practicing Catholics, as all these people were, or almost all these people were, the first thing you do in the morning after the absolutely necessary is you pray. Um, uh, uh, sometimes you say a rosary, sometimes it's just a very brief uh, period of self-reflection and prayer, but it was part of your daily routine. It's also the last thing you did before you got into bed. Um, it's easy in Rococo society, the Enlightenment, the philosophes, and Voltaire, and skepticism, and all this, encyclopedias, and all this kind of stuff, to forget the fact that the vast majority of these people were devout practicing Catholics, even if they interpreted it differently than may, we might uh, uh, interpret religious observance and morality today. So this particular object is part of the environment and part of Pompadour's day, just like the makeup table where we're going to see her making up her face um, in just a few minutes. is part of the daily uh, routine of someone of Pompadour's rank and, and, um, uh, and position at court. In her uh, desire to uh, represent herself through Boucher's uh, uh, paintbrushes as the royal friend rather than the royal mistress, she commissioned uh, two very, very large, uh, this is tiny and this is really big, uh, but it's just about as big as the wall uh, of the room. Anyway, um, she commissioned uh, a pendant pair, two of these, that are meant to uh, represent the history of her, in, in mythological allegorical form, the history of her relationship to the king. These pictures are called the rising of the sun, which is what we see here, and the setting of the sun, which is the pendant. The rising would have been uh, displayed on the left, the setting of the sun would have been displayed on the right. These were designed uh, for a, a sort of, you might call it a little love nest, um, that uh, Pompadour, when she was still mistress, had established with Louis XV. It was a royal property that he actually presented to her. It was a kind of a ramshackle, you know, broken down type of place with overgrown gardens. 
He uh, is called the Chateau de Bellevue. This is the second from the bottom on uh, the October 16th key terms. And um, she took Bellevue, Pompadour took Bellevue, and turned it into one of the most elegant, sort of small-scale, domestic, intimate spaces of the entire Rococo. Alas, um, uh, her, even with her generous uh, stipend from the state and large uh, uh, occasional gifts from the king, she was in horrible financial trouble and ultimately, even before she died, had to sell Bellevue and all of its contents. That's why these things, these objects are scattered. Uh, the little uh, nativity, which would have been in her private prayer room there, is in Lyon in the museum. Rising and setting of the sun are in the Wallace Collection in London, and these objects are scattered all over Europe and some even into uh, North America. But for a few years in the 1750s, Bellevue was this amazing monument, uh, not only to Pompadour's taste, but to the social and sexual practices of the court, this increasing sense to get away from Versailles, to find greater intimacy and more privacy, at least as 18th century aristocrats understood um, uh, the notion of privacy. These two pictures then, uh, as I mentioned, represent the trajectory, just as Apollo takes the chariot from the sea in the morning, the sun rises, it goes through the sky and then goes down again, thus the rising and the setting of the sun. Apollo, of course, is Louis XV. Uh, there's an old history of, uh, of um, uh, mythological associations of, of the king, uh, Louis XIV, with Apollo. Remember when we talked about Lemoine's uh, ceiling decorations in the Salon d'Hercule at Versailles, um, he chose Hercules being uh, made immortal and given Hebe as a bride on Mount Olympus. And generally speaking, in terms of mythological referent, uh, Louis XV preferred Hercules to Apollo because of Apollo's association with his uh, uh, great-grandfather, uh, Louis XIV. But in, for, for uh, Pompadour's purposes, this idea of trajectory, her rise as royal mistress and then her descent as the royal friend, there's no parallel mythography associated with Hercules that could convey uh, that type of uh, symbolic message, so she reverts to the older uh, pattern of Apollo. These pictures have all of the lush, uh, sort of glorious color uh, that we saw originally back, I'm going to do this, in the Triumph of Venus. It's still one of these sort of marine frolics. Remember, Apollo pulls the chariot um, when sun rises. This comes out of the, uh, of the eastern ocean and then descends into the western ocean. So it has some of the same kind of uh, accessories that one would associate with a picture like the Triumph of Venus. Extraneous nereids, sea nymphs, you know, mermen and, um, and, mer and uh, other figures, tritons blowing conch shells, and, and they announce Apollo's um, rise um, uh, from the ocean. Here is the goddess of the dawn, Aurora, um, and here she is the stand-in for Pompadour. Um, uh, sort of holding his chariot, here's the horses and all this kind of stuff, um, as they're about to uh, uh, ascend and all this, the goddess of dawn here, another uh, uh, prototype for Pompadour, uh, holding her Pompadour's favorite flower, the peony, as the darkness here is being pushed aside, pushed back by the little cherubs and all this kind of stuff here. Um, now, neither the figure of Apollo or the two manifestations of Aurora, which again are the stand-ins for Pompadour, these are not portraits, but they're symbolic stand-ins. Uh, they're basically simulacra, in that sense, um, of these two uh, types of figures. So this kind of glorious display of, um, of a sort of a mythological, and again, remember the scale of this, these were huge. These had to have been the biggest pictures actually in the Chateau de Bellevue, which wasn't all that large. Um, anyway, um, you can see this kind of centripetal composition. It's uh, sort of the margins have these kind of swirling, vortextual uh, types of things, but the real confrontation is between uh, Pompadour and um, uh, Louis XV, here uh, sort of maintaining their mythological guises. In the setting of the sun, this is the time when she is the, the royal friend instead of the royal mistress uh, that we see here. Um, he is basically in some ways about to descend into the Western Ocean and there's this sort of gesture of sweet, tender goodbyes. What's 
It's, it, what it's being said goodbye to here, of course, is the, is the intimate sexual uh, relationship between the two. She's not really going anywhere, and she knows that the next morning that the sun's going to rise again, and she will still be uh, figured at court. Contemporaries, again, court contemporaries, the people that saw this, you have to remember that Chateau was a hard invitation. Remember when I was talking about Louis XIV when we were discussing Charles, uh, Charles de la Fosse and the uh, Bacchus and Ariadne, which was made for the Chateau de Marly. Marly was a hunting lodge, uh, but it was a place also that Louis the, even Louis XIV, lover of pomposity and grandeur and royal adulation, and all of that, even he occasionally wanted to go to a smaller place with a small group of intimate friends to hunt. He took his mistresses there sometimes as well. But Bellevue functions on the same level. It's not, it has no association with the hunt at all, but it is one of these places of refuge, a place of greater intimacy with smaller rooms, a sort of um, um, uh, uh, tableau de mode idea that we saw with the Declaration of Love uh, by uh, Dutrois a little bit earlier. These pictures then, uh, the rising and the setting of the sun, would have been, not have been seen at salons or anything like that. They would have been studied at Bellevue by people who were already very much uh, uh, in, the, in the court circle, the intimate court circle, of Louis um, and Pompadour. And I'd like to finish the discussion of Boucher with this extremely fascinating uh, picture that has not only ama amazing uh, association with Pompadour and Louis, but it tells us probably more about Pompadour herself than any of these other pictures that, um, I've, uh, uh, that I've showed you, shown you. Uh, this is Madame de Pompadour at her toilette. This elaborate frame, and it's a good thing we have the image um, in this elaborate frame, the frame itself, believe it or not, is a Rococo reproduction of the 20th century. This is not the original frame. In point of fact, the painting in its original form was not oval at all. It was a rectangle and would have been in a sort of a frame like this, but I don't suspect nearly as elaborate and certainly not with the oval form. The picture has been cut down from its original dimensions, which we have no idea what they were. Um, uh, we assume that it was a little, bit, uh, a little bit bigger than what we're looking at here, but we don't know how much has been cut down, but there's evidence on all four sides of the, of the rectangular canvas that it has been cut down. Um, I had, I, this is at Harvard in the Fog Art Museum, and I, got, I was very fortunate to get to see this thing when they were restoring it outside of the frame. So you can see parts of the canvas uh, that are covered up by this neo-Rococo uh, type of frame here, but they're basically just sort of generic descriptions of the extended space, like a little bit more clothing over here, but just space up here, a little bit more of the makeup table that you see down at the bottom right. But it's still very hard to determine exactly what the um, dimensions of it would be. We also don't know uh, for whom this was painted. Um, uh, some people say, well, clearly uh, she wanted to give it to Louis XV, but there's no indication that it ever entered the royal collection. Some people object to the date, 1758, because the, uh, the painting's provenance excuse me, is so confused. They say it must have been done a few years later and probably had maybe uh, just been finished when she died in 1764, and that's why it sort of just doesn't really land anywhere. Others suggest that she it was uh, commissioned uh, for her brother, uh, her younger brother, the Marquis de Marigny, who we'll talk about uh, a little bit later. Anyway, all that aside, what we do know about this picture is that it shows one of the most intimate and important acts of an upper-class court lady. It's not just her at her makeup table. It, is at, it shows her as an artist making up her face. For, in, according to uh, court rituals. This process of applying makeup to the face to create the court image um, of a woman uh, that we see here is called maquillage, uh, and it's uh, very closely associated with the toilette. Now, obviously, an 18th century upper-class woman's toilette is not what we think of uh, when we think of a to of toilet um, or something like that. It's the complete act of preparing oneself to, get, to emerge from the extreme private center of the boudoir into the court. 
It's a long process. It often took three or four hours uh, for a woman to uh, go through this process to have her hair uh, put up and powdered, uh, to, have, to have, actually have her dressed with her stays, to apply makeup. And this practice in the boudoir, and this is not the bedroom itself, it's a room right off the bedroom where she could receive her closest and most intimate friends at Bellevue, of course, including the king. Um, anyway, this is part of, of sort of the, 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 this increasing desire for privacy in a world where upper class people did not have much privacy at all. So the boudoir, the makeup, the toilette table and all of this is a very intimate act. Many people state that she is looking into a mirror, which is what one would expect with this direct frontality. But in point of fact, the mirror is here, where she is using to apply her makeup. Look at the little brush here with the rouge and the, in the uh, bristles and all this, where she's already been applying it uh, to her face. Um, the, uh, the look is basically at a friend or at someone, we assume the king or some very close, some intimate, in the boudoir setting. In this case, it's actually Boucher. Boucher here is an artist who is making an image of a woman who is practicing artistry on her own face. In other words, her face is her canvas and his canvas produces the image of her making herself up uh, in this particular way. There are all sorts of signifiers of status here. The rouge, of course, is the most important because in terms of makeup, that's the last thing that went on. Um, as I mentioned before, rouge was reserved only for aristocratic women of the court. And even though her uh, origins were bourgeois, she was ennobled by the king so as a marquise. Uh, so she was uh, then entitled and expected uh, to wear makeup at court. Even poor Marie Leszczynska, the Polish uh, princess who was very pious and kind of you know, simple um, in terms of her taste, even she was required to wear uh, rouge although we know that she didn't like it and thought that it was sort of um, um, a demeaning thing for a woman to have to do. On her wrist, her right wrist here, you see a, a, a diamond studded bracelet with an oval uh, cameo portrait of Louis XV. She made this herself, not the jeweled part, but the cameo, something that she actually engraved, I'm sure with a lot of help. Uh, but uh, having it here on her wrist, reaffirms her role not as the royal mistress but as the royal friend. So this, uh, this image of a, a Pompadour at her toilette tells us a lot about how women of this class, and Pompadour in particular, um, actually lived their daily lives. Uh, she would have gone in early to have prayed, said her morning prayers before this image of the nativity in her little private chapel. She might have strolled by the rising and the setting of the sun, and then, you know, of course, Bellevue is gone by the time this picture is done. Um, but anyway, shows herself here in the act of preparing herself to appear in public. This idea of private to public gives, a, a, gives us a sort of a feel of what Boucher's relationship with her must have been. I mean, there's no indication there's anything funny um, or you know, sexually weird about it at all. But clearly, they were friends. And um, he was a, a great admirer of her. Boucher painted very few portraits. He did a lot of genre paintings and theatrical designs, tapestry cartoons for Beauvais, like the Chinoiserie things that I showed you before, mythologie galant pictures for uh, various uh, collectors, including Pompadour, who was an avid collector of those kinds of images, but only a handful of portraits, and most of those are of Pompadour. So clearly she's able to bring out something in him um, artistically that uh, uh, probably he didn't even know was there. Um, the fact that she patronized so many of his works in different genres may have given her sufficient leverage to have convinced him uh, to, uh, to uh, paint her portraits. And there are half a dozen of them um, altogether. Okay. I'd like now to move to the key terms list uh, from October uh, 23rd. And um, I'd like to start um, uh, this with an artist named Carly Van Loe. As you might guess from the Van Loe, he was not, the family was a dynasty like so many of these families are of painters. Um, it, uh, he was a member of a dynasty of artists who were originally from Flanders, like the Battle of Waterloo, L-O-O, -O, is in modern Belgium. This is Flanders, and this is definitely a Flemish name. Back in the 17th century, the Van Loes, there are lots of them, uh, were major artists in Antwerp and Brussels. 
um, and that were very much a part of the kind of the Flemish uh, uh, visual culture. But increasingly, these uh, uh, Flemish artists, as patronage dried up there, began to flock uh, to Paris and to Versailles to work for the court. And Carla Van Loo was actually born in France of an immigrant uh, Flemish father. Carla Van Loo is the artist better than anybody else who represents not only the problems of history painting in the Royal Academy, but also how an artist who is one of the major leading functionaries of the Academy was able to negotiate the ideology of the Academy and its insistence on the hierarchy of genres and the importance of traditional type of history painting with the emerging markets that were favoring um, exoticist pictures, chinoiserie, turquery, those kind of things, genre paintings, pastorals like the Are You Thinking of the Grapes, um, uh, and other types of, of pictures, because that's where the patronage demands were. His real interest, though, um, uh, at, when he, at, if he had, his, he had his choice, would have been to paint brand style history pictures. And I'm going to show you a small suite of the variety within Carla Van Lowe's work. He won every prize offered by the Academy. He was far more famous in his lifetime than Boucher. Boucher, as we know now, is the great artist of the High Rococo. It's Carla Van Lowe who was the Academy's darling and, the, and sort of the art-loving public's darling. Boucher was always painting for a much more restricted uh, type of clientele. And so many of Boucher's pictures, he did exhibit at the salons, at the Academy salons, and he is a major historical painter figure and all of that. But so much of his work went immediately into the private sphere and was not exhibited publicly. Carla Van Lowe is not an artist like that. He does work for Pompadour briefly, as we'll see but he has a much higher public and academic profile. This is a picture called The Grand Turk Giving a Concert for His Mistress, and it dates 1727. Um, by this time, he had already painted a couple of uh, ceiling frescoes and altar pieces for Roman churches. He had been at the French Academy in Rome, and had covered himself with honors there. He came back to Paris, and immediately sort of since, and of course, remember this picture is uh, the same year as the Concours of 1727, although Carlo Van Lowe was not a full member of the Academy and was not a part of that. He certainly understood what that was about and the problems uh, uh, and the challenges of, of two historical painters that this, that, that painting competition in 1727 actually um, uh, suggested. And he also was savvy enough to understand the nature of patronage and the shifts in patronage from the last days of Louis XIV and then into the Regency and the emergence of, of the Rococo. Some interesting things about this, uh, this of course we've seen a couple already, this is a very good example of French truquerie. Uh, this kind of exoticism that uh, uh, illustrates both the fear and the fascination with the Islamic world, particularly the Ottoman Empire that was you know, centered on Constantinople in Turkey. Um, remember, as late as 1683, the Turks, the Ottoman Turks, besieged Vienna, and it looked for a while like they were going to capture the city. This is the capital city of the Habsburg Empire. These were dangerous people, uh, militarily, and all of that. And although they're still dangerous and still feared um, in the 18th century, it's clear that the Ottoman Empire is beginning a decline and is not as much of a threat to Europe as it had been um, in uh, the 16th and 17th century. The Grand Turk here is shown um, on the left uh, wearing a sort of an exoticized turban. He looks more like an Old Testament uh, a king or a prophet. This has been borrowed from a Rembrandt, but he does an authentic Turkish person. But remember these exoticisms, as we saw with Boucher's um, Chinese scenes, um, authenticity wanes as an important factor in these kinds of visualizations as the 18th century progress progresses. The male figures almost all wear turbans. There's one uh, Western person here uh, playing a little viol uh, that we see here. But these guys, the, the, uh, some of the musicians and certainly the audience, are wearing turbans, which is the signifier of Islamic other status. That is, they are the, they are the Turks. The women almost exclusively are European. The one playing the little uh, spinet here. Now she's a, a, a female figure here in the turban. There's one back here. But if you begin to look through the crowd of the women, uh, you see that they are European. This is a very subtle way that Van Lowe shows um, uh, the fact that lots and lots of European Christian women um, had been captured in raids on the southern coast of Italy and Spain and France by Corsair Muslim pirates and then taken to the slave markets 
um, in North Africa, uh, Syria and Turkey and places like that. And so the pretty ones in, usually in the harems. Um, uh, and that's part of, of what's going on here. So the Grand Turk um, uh, uh, and the concert for his mistress and all of that is basically a, a kind of a dressed up, anesthetized, um, desensitized way of suggesting this har harem, this, this idea of white Christian women in slavery. The harem was endlessly fascinating to French audiences in the 18th century, male and female. The idea of a captive population of, of beautiful young women kept explicitly for the pleasure of one man um, is something obviously that men uh, found uh, fascinating. What women liked about this form of turkery was the costuming. Things like uh, women wearing turbans, they began to appear in portraits by the 1740s of these sort of uh, very elaborate bejeweled types of turbans as a Turkish accessory. Women at informal costume parties, a la Turk, that is in the Turkish fashion, began to appear in harem pants, as big baggy uh, satin uh, uh, pants that would come down and, and sort of grass uh, come together right below the knee, and then silk stockings and slippers. So the, uh, you can actually see in the, some of the male figures some of these kinds of Islamic slippers, often made out of red or pale yellow leather. So accessories become, uh, Turkish harem accessories become a de rigueur. One thing about this that marks it though is a picture with a Rococo sensibility. Not only is it sort of uh, downplaying of the real exploitation um, of, of, a, of an Islamic uh, uh, harem and all of that. Look also at the Turkey rug. I forgot to mention that. This is clearly an oriental Turkish uh, type of carpet, a luxury item. Um, the mistress is placed right on the center of the composition. She's on the central axis. Um, the sultan um, here seems to be sort of slightly moving away from her as she is indicating uh, the player who's uh, singing and playing and all of that as if she is giving instruction in this subtle way. Again, even it, it, the mistress, not the wife or the sultana, but the mistress um, of the sultan here is clearly in the privileged position, both in terms of her physical rhetoric and of her uh, physical placement uh, within the composition. As I mentioned, Carlo Banlo did work briefly for um, uh, Madame de Pompadour. There's no indication that she didn't like these, uh, the pictures that, that he made for her, uh, but it's also very clear that she much preferred Boucher. Uh, to, uh, to Carla Van Loe. Also, by the time she becomes the royal friend, in addition to Boucher, she's beginning to um, uh, patronize a whole group of major French sculptors. Pompadour, as we'll see when we reconvene, uh, Pompadour was deeply interested um, in uh, contemporary French sculpture and porcelain manufacturing and particularly bisque porcelain models and things like that. The picture I'm showing you here is one, of, uh, is one of a suite of four pictures made for Bellevue, the Chateau of Bellevue uh, that we talked about, uh, by Carla Van Lowe for uh, Madame de Pompadour. This is called Madame de Pompadour as a Sultana, and it dates about 1752. Um, this series of four pictures, and you look at the irregular shapes, that's because they were commissioned for this particular shape so that they could go into boiseries, into wood panels as part of the interior decor. They were never intended to be hanging on the wall the way of painting we think of today. They, they are part of the architectural fabric of the interior. They're part really of the wall, although they are canvas uh, put into these uh, sort of oddly shaped frames. Irregularly shaped objects, paintings or whatever. Um, is again part of a Rococo aesthetic. Uh, that they, the idea of rectangularity, that was too Versailles, too pompous, too grand and all of that, too predictable. Uh, there's a fanciful sort of curvilinear arabesque quality to a lot of Rococo design uh, that's seen here. Unfortunately, the, the, these were torn, taken out and the frames were lost uh, when, when Bellevue was uh, uh, actually decommissioned or destroyed uh, during the revolution but the paintings themselves were preserved and survived. This is in, the series is in the Musée d'Art Décoratif uh, in Paris. Anyway, we've already seen a sultana. This was Mademoiselle de Clermont de Bourbon. 
um, uh, that I've talked about before in that sort of uh, is sort of the dominating figure of, in a harem scene um, at Chantilly, which was her chateau north of Paris. Remember, she was Louis XV's cousin and a major, major uh, uh, figure um, in his life, particularly as an erotic advisor. This is a role that Pompadour sort of took over from Mademoiselle de Clermont um, uh, in the 1750s after she became the royal friend instead of uh, the royal mistress. Anyway, you see a, a, a scene here where a black servant at the left is coming in pouring a cup of uh, coffee, again a quintessential Turkish beverage, Turkish coffee before it became, got started coming from other parts of the world, uh, is, is pouring um, a pompadour or a cup of coffee. She's shown here this kind of intimate uh, setting. Um, uh, she's got a hookah in her hand. This is a hashish pipe. Uh, here's the part you suck, and here's the, the bottom of it where you put the hash uh, to sort of, you know, do this. And this is, again, a quintessentially Turkish type of activity. Uh, she's wearing a turban. But the thing about this is remarkable, and um, I have a private theory that this may be why she didn't like Carla Van Loo, uh, his art as much in terms of her image. There's a kind of a masculinized quality to her here that we don't see in pictures like these, you know. She's still, even though she's a royal friend, she's still pretty and elegant and all of that. There's a kind of a, a forcefulness. Look at how squared her shoulders is, the angularity of it. Uh, the fact that she also looks older here. Um, and this is probably a more accurate image of what the woman actually looked like um, uh, at, at this day uh, than, than uh, some of the others uh, by Boucher. Who, Boucher can't help but flatter. Everybody looks great in a Boucher, kind of like a Van Dyke. Uh, Carl Van Lowe has a more realistic or, or maybe naturalistic um, uh, penchant here. But certainly the Sultana as the head of the harem and part of uh, Pompadour's role in the post-mistress, uh, 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 physical mistress mode was to be an advisor to these young women who Louis XV wanted to um, you know, seduce or to have as part of his um, uh, 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 harem, figuratively speaking. So this kind of Rococo exoticism in the Turkery mode is deployed uh, to show Pompadour's new position, but it also shows us, I believe, a new Pompadour uh, that is a, a much more sort of authoritative but older and mas somewhat masculinized type of woman um, that certainly denotes her position of continuing influence and authority and, and, and uh, a connection to the king. But at the same time, she's not pretty here. This is not, a, this is not in any way a, a, a sort of an a, a beautiful woman who's aging well. It sort of uh, has, a, in that sense, a rather unflattering quality to it. That may be why. Um, uh, this is the only project we, that we know that she commissioned uh, from Carly Van Loeb. One more point about this. <clears throat> at Versailles, and I mentioned this briefly uh, with Nautier, um, at Versailles, uh, Louis XV, um, uh, in a sort of a little discreet uh, pavilion, um, uh, sort of off grounds as it were, but certainly with an easy, um, an easy carriage ride or a horse ride, um, he basically uh, uh, set up an establishment that can really can't be characterized in any other way except as a bordello. Uh, this was primarily for decently born um, aristocratic da daughters of aristocratic families who would come on hard times or poverty, some middle class girls wanting, hoping, like Pompadour did, uh, to catch the king's favor and all of that. These women were provided pensions and they lived at this institution. It was called the Chateau de Serf, that is the stag house. Um, and this was a site where the king and his friends and you know, uh, associate, male associates and all of that could go for an evening's pleasure. And it, these happened with great uh, frequency. In point of fact, it, the Chateau de Cerf was a harem. And the, it's sort of the, it's a French Rococo harem instead of a North African or, or, or Near Eastern um, Islamic one. Um, most of these young girls were uh, sort of discarded, you know, pregnancies and these other kinds of problems. Um, but the it, fact that the institution itself existed is basically um, an indication of what the kinds of things that were important uh, to Louis the Fifteenth. Some of these young women uh, basically were tutored by um, Madame de Pompadour in her role as a French Rococo Sultana, that is, a sort of an older woman who's been there, done that, and um, is advising 
um, uh, women. Also, he's helping to she's helping to select uh, these young women for this particular type of uh, a position, pun intended, um, uh, at court. So the Chateau de Serf then it ties in, yeah, in, in sort of as a kind of a physical imperative. There were orgies there. I mean, this was apparently a wild place. A lot of people, uh, visitors, Englishmen in particular, coming uh, were often invited to these kind of debauches. Um, and all of that. But it clearly shows us a large part of the sexual culture of upper class uh, men um, in, the, in the middle of the uh, 18th century. So before we get too enthusiastic about the Rococo as the Renaissance of women and exceptional women and women influence, which is what I've emphasized up to here, the Chateau de Surf is a cautionary tale about what the limitations of that kind of uh, empowerment of women actually are. The vast majority of women are still, uh, particularly those attached to the court who had no influence at court, um, uh, the vast majority of these women are still exploited and then when, you know, when no longer appealing are you know, sort of rudely discarded with taxi fare, uh, as it were, uh, back to Paris. And remember also, I've talked about this with um, uh, Natier, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, and other artists, about this series of hunt pictures that were uh, commissioned by Louis XV for the Petit Appartement um, at, at, at Versailles. And this shows Louis' other major interests. We've seen two of these, and this is the third, a commission from Boucher. This is called the Ostrich Hunt uh, from 1736. In 1736, Boucher was an artist who had just sort of fairly recently established himself um, as a member of the Academy, as a history painter and all of that. But this commission for Versailles was not history painting at all. It was a sort of exoticized genre paintings, and there were five of them uh, altogether, commissioned from five leading artists. This shows us de Troyes, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Carla Van Lowe willing to negotiate the patterns of patronage because that was necessary to further his career. Although I can't imagine that Carla Van Lowe felt very much sympathy, or much less uh, someone like uh, Long Cray uh, with his tiger hunt. I can't imagine that they felt very much sympathy with the subject, but it was a royal commission. These uh, were sort of taken out of Versailles at the time of the Revolution, and they were scattered in a number of French uh, provincial museums, but fortunately in this case, probably because of the elaboration and the beauty of them, the original frames were preserved. So you see these sort of gilded, cartouche, irregularly shaped um, uh, uh, canvases uh, put into these extremely expensive, much more expensive than the picture, um, uh, elaborate frames. Uh, these exotic hunts, you know, uh, again, they have the requisite palm trees and the figures in turbans to put them in a place that's other, that is in some other part of the world, but still bringing the idea of the hunt culture, which we talked about at length with Udry, um, especially, brings it into the heart of Versailles. As I've said more than once, Louis XV's primary interests were hunting and whoring, um, and not necessarily in that order. So hunt images are the kinds of things. This is, this is the king uh, doing this for a very important part of the Chateau de Versailles, the major place in France. This is where Louis XIV would have put history paintings, battle pictures, treaties, uh, scenes from his own life in French history, in other words, important didactic historical uh, scenes. Louis XV had no interest in it. This must have frustrated the academy to no end because you know, they're struggling ideologically to continue to assert the authority of the hierarchy of the genres, and the king is not helping, is not helping at all. And you would expect that would be one of the great bastions of support, but Louis XV was simply not interested in these things. Um, an ostrich hunt is rather unusual. You know, tiger hunts, hippopotamus hunts, bear hunts, uh, lion hunts, these are the kind of stock and trade of these sort of exotic um, uh, hunting scenes. And these go back, by the way, into the 16th century at least. This is not a new genre of art. An ostrich, though, is a rather interesting uh, introduction uh, to this uh, particular thing. Probably Louis XV picked the animals himself, and that may have been his extent of involvement in the entire commission until they were installed. But it should be pointed out that the year before this commission uh, was given uh, to Boucher, the first ostrich, pair of ostriches was introduced to the Royal Menagerie at Versailles. So the, the, sort of the, the, sort of, uh, the kind of novelty of an ostrich 
um, in one of the, the five hunt scenes where you'd normally expect other kinds of more ferocious type. I don't think of an ostrich as particularly ferocious, although this one looks immensely pissed off. Of course, if somebody were sticking a sword into your uh, underside, you'd probably be mad too. But um, anyway, this I, I suspect there is a, 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 a this, this is not a coincidence that people now knew at Versailles what an ostrich actually looked like. And so uh, if, it, if it moves, Louis XV will hunt it. And so vicariously through these, uh, these Turkish agents, these Islamic agents in the turbans and with the palm trees and all of that, that's exactly what he's doing. Okay, this painting by uh, Carlo Manilow is really where he lived intellectually. This is the kind of stuff that Carlo Manilow wanted to paint as an ambitious history painter within the Academy. Despite the fact that everything we've seen and a lot of today before this and a lot of other pictures by Carlo Manilow um, uh, are in the lesser genres because that, let's face it, he knew and we know that that's where the money was. This is what he wanted to paint. This is what he wanted to rest his uh, reputation on. And it's these kind of pictures that critics like La Fonte de Saint-Étienne and the reflections on the current state of painting in France, these are the kind of things they kept holding up and pushing forward as the paradigms of what his Academy history painting sh uh, painters uh, should be doing. This is called The Condemnation of Saint-Denis, and it dates uh, 1752. It's one of a pair of altarpieces designed for a French convent church. Uh, Saint-Denis is the patron saint of Paris, so this, this has a, a, a sort of a, a civic pride um, aspect to it, too. Its pendant is St. George and the Dragon. St. George, of course, being the uh, patron saint of England. And so these two pictures, uh, juxtaposed to one another, are, are normally thought of as... Um, uh, uh, part of the attempt in the early 1750s to avoid an uh, outbreak of a major war between France and uh, England. This happens in 1756 anyway, but the fact that the two pictures were, to, uh, were together and conceived of and painted at the same time and as pendants may suggest this kind of diplomatic um, uh, uh, role for, uh, for the two pictures. In point of fact, at the Revolution, this convent was uh, uh, nationalized and all the artwork in it was taken and sold. Uh, this particular one now is in the museum in Dijon. Uh, the other one is in uh, Pau in, south, southern, in, in the museum in southern France. Anyway, Saint-Denis here is being condemned to death by a Roman um, emperor for his Christianity and failing to uh, you know, sort of worship uh, the pagan gods and all of that. Um, here we see him. Here's his mitre to show him his crozier, his staff, and his hat, bishop's hat, and all that, to, uh, to show his status as a bishop. In the very old fashioned way, Carlo Manlo gives him a halo, which is weird, uh, but when you consider the fact that he's the patron saint of Paris and that his relics were venerated in Paris in processions and all this kind of stuff, this anachronistic inclusion of a halo makes a little bit more sense. The Roman emperor's head here, and this is perfect academic practice is based on an ancient Roman bust um, of the Republican period, probably about 150 uh, uh, of the Common Era and all of that. The magnificent sort of Romanizing, classicizing architecture, uh, the solidity of the composition, uh, the, uh, the visual rhetoric of the bodies. Look at how correctly, the, correctly done the drawing is of the emperor's body here. This is convincing as a, a young male form, just as Denis here is uh, convincing as an older uh, man who's sort of swooning and sort of now looking up to heaven um, uh, as the, you know, the next step um, in his um, um, hagiography in his life as a saint. There's a dignity and a restraint and a sense of decorum about this. This could have been an hysterical picture. Think about how Baroque artists would have uh, interpreted this. They would have been, oh my God, no, 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 no please don't kill Sandini. You're condemned and all this kind of with flowers and you know, angels and shafts of golden light. Just again, a hysterical a type of Baroque picture. Here, even though it's very dramatic, at the same time the drama is subdued. That's what classicism, or I would say here borderline neoclassism, actually does. This is what people like Lafont thought of as the antidote to the Rococo. And these kind of pictures by Carlo Van Lowe uh, basically uh, are very formative for the next generation of French history painters, which of course culminates in Jacques-Louis David and real French uh, neoclassicism um, in the 1780s. 
Okay, um, I'd like now to talk about this last, last picture by Carla Van Lowe. It's called The Art, this should be The Arts, please add the S. <laughs> I don't know, it must have been Dezzy. On basic workshop, the arts imploring the fates to spare Madame de Pompadour, and it was painted in 1764, the year of her death. Madame de Pompadour's death uh, has never been adequately explained. She's still a relatively young woman in her 40s. It's never been adequately, adequately explained what killed her. She had survived an attack of smallpox uh, back in 1757, and that's one of the reasons why she's heavily applying rouge to her face in Boucher's a portrait of her at her toilette, although he never would have shown the scars and uh, the, of, of the smallpox itself. But one of the reasons most people are, uh, uh, had smallpox at some point in their lives in this period, Louis the Fifteenth almost died of it in 1744 and did die of it in 1774. Had another attack, also unusual. But um, her, in any event, her death, she'd been in poor health for four or five years before her death. Her death was unexpected. It came rather suddenly. This picture of the arts imploring the fates to spare Madame de Pompadour was commissioned not by Louis XV, but by her brother, her younger brother. His name is Abel Francois Poisson de Vandière, who was then made Marquis de Marigny. He, as uh, Pompadour's younger brother, was uh, basically a, ro a royal favorite himself. The king liked him uh, very much. Um, he was a touchy guy because of his middle-class origins. Now, it was okay for a bourgeois girl, a talented, beautiful, ambitious bourgeois girl, to become the king's mistress and then to be elevated in the aristocracy. That created a lot of ruffles, but it was a little more understandable. But when a middle-class man is made into a marquis, that's a fairly high rank, and only a duke is higher, um, in the French aristocratic system. This created a lot of animosity towards Marigny himself, and he was super sensitive to any kind of slight about his social class. And of course, having a last name that means fish um, in French, is that doesn't help uh, uh, the, uh, the cause very much. This picture was probably commissioned after she had already died. It's a small thing, it's not very big, uh, maybe two feet high and maybe you know, uh, 18 inches wide, something like that. It's now in the Frick Museum in Pittsburgh. So it's something next time you're in Pittsburgh, it's a beautiful little museum in a park, a nice place to go uh, for an afternoon. Not very big, but still this is uh, where the painting is located. It uh, basically the, uh, is a tribute to Pompadour's um, uh, patronage of the visual arts. And that's really what the subject of the picture is. You see down here the art sort of imploring, begging and all this. Uh, the fates are up here, more about them in just a minute. Here you have painting, who's, um, here's her uh, palette with paintbrushes and all that. Music over here holding a lyre and a trumpet and all of that. You have architecture down here, here's a compass and a T-square and you know, architectural design books and all of that. Um, over here on the left with the mallet you have sculpture. And, they, and, the, and these people are just wailing in the background, just sort of excessive, like, kind of like a Greek uh, funeral or something. You hire people to scream and holler as you go into the graveyard. Anyway, they're imploring too. But here's where the action is going on. Um, you have the thread of life. Here are the fates. We know their names, and I can't remember them right now, except this one is Clotho. She is the one who takes her scissors, and she is cutting the thread of life. The, one measures it, uh, one sort of creates it, here's a distaff. One creates it, one sort of, oh no, sorry, here's the distaff. Uh, one uh, creates it, one measures it, and then one decides when you die. Here is Jupiter, a.k.a. Louis XV, coming in here trying to stop her. But the one thing the king of the gods can't do is interfere with the fates. So when she decides it's time to go, it's time to go. So the idea that Louis XV is interested in trying to keep her alive, that her brother certainly must have been very nervous at her death because she no, he no longer had her protection, uh, this is probably why this painting came into existence in the first place. It's listed in Marigny's uh, death inventory uh, when he died uh, in 1781, and then the, the painting was lost for almost 150 years. It re-emerges in the early part of the 20th century and was identified by this inventory line in, in Marigny's um, uh, estate, so we know uh, that it is the, uh, the Van Lowe here that they're talking about. It was through Pompadour's influence with the king that, as a very, he was only 22 when he got the appointment, 
that Marigny was created surintendant de bâtiment du roi. Now this is uh, superintendent of the king's buildings. Now this is a title that we've already seen in the Clements article uh, about the Duke d'Antin, and uh, who was the son of one of Louis XV's mistresses, but not his uh, son. Uh, or sorry, one of Louis XIV's mistresses, but not uh, Louis XIV's son. Uh, this is a very important uh, position at court. It becomes more important as the 18th century progressed. Uh, many people have referred to it, and I think with some accuracy, as being the arts czar um, of 18th century France. This is a tremendously influential position. As a young, very young man, uh, it was unprecedented that someone this young would be given this title, but in the Enlightenment mode of thinking, uh, Pompadour and Louis XV decided to send him, before they made the appointment, decided to send him to Italy for a year so that he did a grand tour. He went to the French Academy in Rome, he went to the Vatican Museums, he toured the churches, he went to Naples, he went to Venice, he went to Florence, he went to Bologna, um, and, and Parma and these other places to see the great masterworks. In other words, it was a sort of a lesson and cultural preparation for the role for which he was being uh, prepared. One of the reasons why art history has to be eternally grateful to the Marquis de Marigny, although he doesn't sound like a very pleasant person, but we have to be grateful to him because his entire correspondence, not only with the, the Académie Royale, but also with the French Academy in Rome, all of this survives. And it's clear that he took his administrative duties towards these two institutions very, very seriously. Um, he comments on the works that are sent back from Rome for evaluation and all of this. Um, he gives uh, certain kinds of directives. He rewards artists who work in this style, believe it or not, he's given his sister, um, and is not so interested in things like this. Um, he's the first uh, surintendant of the 18th century who started taking religious painting seriously again and started using government funds to fund altarpieces and other decorative ensembles of, or, or other uh, painting ensembles uh, for Parisian and some provincial churches. He even completely redesigned the high altar at the cathedral at Versailles, you know, made in a much more classicizing and restrained type of manner. So Marigny got his position through his association with Pompadour, but in this case at least he took full advantage of it and uh, uh, created uh, an amazing uh, uh, sort of, sort of long-term, he was super superintendent from uh, 1751 to 1773, uh, that's the longest um, sort of tenure of office of any surintendant in French history, at least before uh, the revolution. Um, before I uh, conclude today, I would at least like to introduce um, uh, the painter Jean-Baptiste Simeon Chardin, who was the leading still life painter um, of the 18th century. His style characteristically um, tends to be much more naturalistic and his subject matter much more humble and bourgeois than really any 18th century French painter that we've looked at so far. He came from very humble origins. Um, even as a young artist, he was in the, the old medieval guild of artists, uh, not even the French Academy becomes a member later. And um, he did all kinds of artistic work uh, in the bro broadly defined. Um, he did some scene, you know, scenes for uh, uh, theater, you know, set designs and things like that. He even produced, as Watteau had done as a very young artist in Paris, little tiny pictures called Santi, that is heads of the Virgin, heads of saints and stuff like that, that would just have been sold at flea markets and things like that for just a penance, in other words, keeping body and soul together. But his talent as a still life painter ultimately came to the fore, and um, he was elected into the, um, uh, into the Academy uh, Royal in seven, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in 1728, and the picture I'm showing you now called The Ray, 1728, is one of his two reception pieces, one of his two morceaux de reception. Remember, artists in the lesser genres, that is not history, had to submit two examples of their painting for free to the Academy Royale that would then be shown in this large gallery of works by the members. It's called a diploma gall gall uh, gallery because when you got your credentials as a member of the Academy, you got a diploma, just like you do when you graduate from college. And they put a specimen or two of your work to show the quality of the works of art of the membership. The Ray is one of his two uh, reception pieces. It's probably the most famous still life um, in 18th century French painting. 
but it shows humble objects, most still lifes. Remember Udri's uh, The Dead Wolf, where you had these sort of crystal glasses, uh, silver trays, beautiful sort of brioche cheeses and deca crystal decanters of various wines and brandies um, and thing like, things like that. That's rather a high life type of uh, still life. Here you've got the low life still life, more like a kitchen still life as this genre is called. Um, he animates, this is a big picture by the way, it's about twice the size of what you would normally um, expect of the image projected um, on the screen. Um, it shows us um, uh, mostly the produce of markets. You see oysters, the cat, kitty cat coming in here is deeply interested in this. There are two mackerel uh, fish, uh, sort of one of them is kind of looking at us in outrage at having been taken and the other one is sort of halfway hiding under the, uh, the beautiful tablecloth here. That large object in the center of the, pop of the composition is, is a skate, what we would now call a, a ray or a stingray or something like that. These were luxury, or not luxury, these were common food items um, in the 18th century. Anyway, you see in terms of the kitchenware, you have earthenware jugs. This isn't porcelain or even a Delftware or anything like that. It's just like common, you know, fired clay and all of that. And like any good still life painter, he has to show off a little bit by having the knife protruding into our space, like a trompe l'oeil. It's almost like you could come up and pull off the knife. That's one of the conventions of still life painting. But the fact that the work is so animated, that there's a kind of a, a, a drama involved in it. The, 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 uh, the skate itself looks almost like a monk or something. You know, the, the, we see the kind of face, almost like a hideous thing. The cat uh, coming in looking at the mackerel, the, uh, the open oysters and all this kind of stuff. Um, still life painters, um, and, and Chardin is by far the best example of it, still life painters were increasingly respected outside of the Royal Academy. Louis XV was a major patron of Chardin, particularly for decorative overdoors for various rooms in these chateaus that, uh, that were being remodeled, at least in his name. But we know that he made a couple of favorable comments about Chardin um, at one point. This brought, up the, this brought up the debate that continues until the Revolution is it better to be a mediocre history painter because of the status of history painting in the academy, or would it be better to be a superior painter in a lesser genre? History comes down badly in all of this because the decision is almost unanimous in favor of artists working in lesser genres with a high degree of talent, of talent. and Chardin is uh, by far uh, the best example of that. I want to conclude with one more of these. Um, still life, of course, uh, for Chardin is how he started out, as we'll see next uh, when we reconvene on November 6th. He comes back to um, a genre painting as a way to kind of elevate himself, but it's always a still life where he's most uh, remarkable. This is called uh, Still Life, Apples, Pears, and a Mug, and as you can guess, this is made up, titled just based on what we're uh, looking at. It dates about 1730 to 1735. Many of his still lifes were not produced for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for commissions. They were basically done for the market. He invariably exhibited at the Salon. He was very proud of the fact that he was um, an Academy artist, although there's not much going on with Salons at this particular date, but he did exhibit uh, still lifes there very frequently. Here again is this sort of uh, kind of humble uh, groups of objects. Here there's much more theater going on. This is a much more contemplative type of still life, just uh, sort of common fruits, you know, pears and pomegranates with this earthenware mug and our, you know, de rigueur uh, knife that sticks out from the ledge. Um, the, the scumbling of the paint creates this kind of atmospheric thing, like a smoky kitchen um, or something like that. His paintings, in terms of their color choices, are the opposite of Boucher. Um, he tends to use very earth tones, you know, siennas and burnt browns and sort of pale reds and things like that, um, uh, rather than the sort of, sort of gaudy uh, kind of Crayola, 64 Crayola crayons and uh, uh, types of things that Boucher uses. For that reason, many people looked at Chardin as a reformer, that is, someone who isn't interested in the mainstream of the Rococo. But as we'll see when we reconvene on November 6th, there is a Rococo for the middle class, too, and Chardin is the painter of that. Far from being a rebel, Chardin is an academic conformist, as we will, we will talk about uh, next time as well. 
So I wanted to use these two still lives by Chardin to introduce you to the artist. They will help set up the reading by Sarah Cohen that I'd like you to do before uh, we reconvene um, on November 6th. And um, I want to talk about exactly what a conformist uh, Chardin is in terms of, of his respect for institutionalized academies uh, and what they can do for an artist's career.